Your deal with priority is so interesting that I wanted to get into. But before we get to that, I did want to ask you a few more things about Enter the Stage, which was um, the first three, uh, the first two songs, especially with Powerful Impact and Brothers Talk Shit. I was always intrigued by, because this is, you know, 93, we had had, we had had all this success with, uh, you know, with NWA, with quote unquote gangster rap. But why do you guys, why do you think people didn't look at you in a similar way, given uh, your lyrics were very confrontational and very, you know, looking at violence and stuff like that? Why do you think you weren't lumped in with that? Because I wasn't gangbanging. I didn't stand on a red or blue side. Right. And it's fucked up that they could promote the death, the destruction, and everything else of the red and the blue side in California. In California, on the ground. But you scumbag motherfucking, yo, you make that's why I got into polit politic uh, politics just now. I've been in it for a while, but I ain't tell nobody. You know, I'm helping the Eric Adams, the mayor, the, the borough president of Brooklyn, become the mayor of New of, of New York City. You know, um, why did I get into politics? Like, why? Did I, because how? It's, it's not. It's, you got red and blue states saying it's cool to hate each other. You got red and blue politicians saying, nah, it's as cool as we, if we hate each other, if we give fuck that nigga, he blue. Like, but you will, but you will go to every extent you have to, to go after young kids who are representing their neighborhoods. The same way you're re representing your party. Your party is red, Republican. Their neighborhood is, is uh, power rule or whatever. They, they power rule from their neighborhood. You know, you, you hate the Democrats, you know, because they blue. But you, you can't stand, but you don't, but, but I mean, you love the Democrats, but because they blue. Or in a political world, you deal with it, you don't say nothing to them, whatever. But when it comes to a crit who's representing the 60s, which is his neighborhood, uh, in order to survive, you automatically consider him a threat to society. So we change in politics. We've changed in politics. Politics is over now. It's over. It's a wrap. When D Donald Trump came in and, you know, people may hate Donald Trump. They may not like him. But one thing that you got to do is even when you don't like your enemy, you still give him respect. If you don't respect your enemy, you don't respect yourself. If you don't respect, period, you don't respect yourself. So even my enemy get respect. And Donald, and I, I'm not, why I'm gonna sit here and say Donald Trump is my enemy when I don't know nothing about none of the, the stuff that he did personally, but I can say that the policies that's been in the office and in, that shit been there. All they do is change CEOs. That company called America been here. Okay? So when Donald Trump came in, he was the first person that said, fuck politicians. You ain't never hear no politician say that. You always heard politicians go, I so what I'm going to do for America is you pure politicians be politics. Donald Trump came in and said, kiss my fucking ass. Fuck politics. Let's get money. This is how we're gonna do this. And some of the decisions you ain't gonna like, you all but the bottom line is that old style of politicians, people sitting on a podium talking nice and promising motherfucker shit. Fuck that bullshit. I'm going to tell you the real. I can't stand you. You I'm cool with. You better make more money. You, your shit is fucked up. You, that. so he changed the mold. He broke the mold. We'll never go back to the cool, hello, America. I am your new president. Like, we'll never be that bored again. We'll never go for those garbage lies again because someone came out and said, that ain't necessary. So when you got people like me, Eric Adams, even down to Kanye West, who 
I won't get into that right now, but he really is serious about running for the next presidency. Even people like that, like, you may think things is a joke because you're not in it, but if you don't know nothing about the judicial system, you don't know about Congress, you don't even know what Congress is. You can't even explain to me the Congress is three different parts. You don't know nothing about the Senate. You don't know how the House of Representatives work. You don't know who controls the Senate, who controls the House. You don't know how bills get put into place and how they get passed and how they get to the president. You think the president just get a note on his desk saying, yo, we want more money, and he has to sign it or he don't. That ain't how it go. Right. So, you know what I'm trying to tell you? So people like me are here now to explain how it really goes. And once, like I told you, once we get into some, and, I, and I'll just say the streets, but once we get into some, it's over. That's why they never wanted us to get in the politics, period, because they knew once we get in, we was going to take it over. There'll be no more old style of doing stuff. Younger people with younger mentalities coming in, making better decisions. All that stuff is going to happen. And that's going to affect our country. Because half of you people that be talking about presidents and this and that, you never even got affected, don't know how you get affected. You, that, man, please. You live life like you did for the past 10 years. You just call on a new name. <laughs> True. Well, it's... Uh... It's very analogous to the music business, what you're saying, is people that don't know how it works like to tell everybody how it works. It's very similar to politics. Very similar, because politicians sell hope. Right. That's the business. That's what they're in the business to do, is to sell hope. That's why they say, if you vote for me, I'll, 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 I'll. Because they're selling hope, and they hope that you buy it. And the music industry, they sell bullshit. Bullshit leads to bullshit. There's no growth in bullshit. Pimping hoes, slapping drugs, selling blah, blah, blah. That shit ain't no growth in that. Ain't no growth in that. So why I'm going to glorify that forever? People who speak about it, speak about it in rap because that's the neighborhood they live in, the culture they came from, and the life they know. As they get older, they get wiser, and they start going, now nah, that shit is bullshit. Right. So it ain't to be praised like it's cool. It's to be praised only because it's a person speaking the true feelings of who they are, putting it out there and letting other people know you yourself can get to the same level if you just keep it 100 and don't let nobody hold you down. Right. Don't let nobody tell you what you can't do. That's the worst thing you can do is tell somebody what, listen to somebody tell you what you can't do. Yeah, because you're giving them power and you're defeating. You know what I'm trying to tell you? So the music industry is God. It's, it's the music industry. But the music industry, you know what's going to happen? Our country is going to implode the same way the music industry imploded. All right? We went from having four verses of record to three verses of record to two verses of record to one verse of record to none damn near. Because these kids ain't saying nothing intricate. They're not saying anything. They're not even saying anything. It's not even about the raps anymore. It's strictly about the life and the, the image of success. It ain't about none of that shit. It's about the image of success. You know what I'm saying? Waka Flocka came on every point on the interview and said, I had $250,000 in, in one pocket from a show, and my record company told me I owed them 15000 when I went up to collect my money. The label told me I owed them 15 bands, but I got 250 in my pocket from shows. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You tell me is that smart. Right. So, it, it, you know, it is. It's, it's, you know, people just want fame and success. They want the good life. Everybody wants the good life. I don't give a fuck about it. I'll smoke a cigar and, and, some, and, and, some, and some motherfucking weed and, and, and I'll dress up nice and I'll do all that shit. But you know why? Because that's the culture that I came up in. That's the Blake family. That's what the Blakes do. That's what we do. That's not a choice in itself. That's what our grandmother raised us to do. To be men. To dress like men. To act like men. To be like men. To talk like men. To walk like men. You understand? So all this little boy shit that these new rappers and these old rappers sitting up there choking the fuck out themselves with a, a neck choker and this motherfucker over here trying to battle each other 
versus 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 versus. They trying to get their last little bit of eggshell fame off of going against each other now. Instead of saying with each other, you want to go against each other. You got old rappers calling out half of old rappers. Come on, man. Like, that don't make no sense. How are we going to unify if we keep falling for the diversity brings the bread? You know why? Because people like to fight, not to unite. More people come to an arena, more people come to a fighting arena or a boxing match than they go to church. I'm just dropping them on you. Right. Now, with a mentality like what I have, you tell me if you think some record company could buy me out. Or that somebody, you can't get, you can't do nothing for me, but you can do a lot with me. That's why Drew High, that's why I love him. Well, let's get into the deal of priority then. I love, I love Drew High. I love him like my brother. And and how how and why is that the case? Because I love Drew. I love his character. I love, we've become so close over the years and his family is like my family. You know, his father, rest in peace, used to kiss me on the cheek when he met me. Rest in peace, my father acknowledged his father. We both got our mothers to survive right now. His mother is everything to me. You know what I'm saying? His mother hold me down. Like, cause she be get like, she be get giving me shouts out, stuff like that. Those things mean a lot to me. So the fact that we are past music, me and Drew, anytime we need to be there for each other, we there for each other. Anytime, for anything. And when you have that type of relationship, that's where the word love comes in. Because I won't do that for everybody. I just won't. There's a lot of reasons why I won't. You know what I'm saying? You can't be genuine, or you can't be you can't treat anybody with the same level of genuosity that you treat others. You cannot do that. You only treat people the way they treat you. So when did you make that realization about your relationship with Drew? What happened or when when did it happen? Shit, it's hard to say, you know, because from day one, when I looked him in the eye, I knew I saw genuosity. He was, a, I saw a hard worker. I saw somebody who was willing to bust their ass for Black Moon and get bagel money for it. And I, and I, and I knew something was just different. And that's why I walked up to him and I asked him, yo, you want to come with me? I'm opening up my own label. And he said, yeah. And we formed the, our own management, I mean. And then after that, we was in a car that day. And I said, fuck that, man. We're going to form our own label and take over this whole game. And he said, if you had a label, what would you want to call it? I said, well, when we walk through the door, I want motherfuckers to duck down. And he said, that's the name of the label. Hmm. So then how did you guys, did you get approached by Priority or did you go to them for the deal that you ended up getting at Priority? We got a deal. We, we got approached by... Um, a guy named Art Yeager, to my knowledge, um, uh, I would say approached or maybe Drew approached him. I wasn't really sure that day, but Drew informed me of a, of a, of a gentleman by the name of Art Yeager who had so much belief in us. Art Yeager had so much belief in us. I swear, I wish I would. I knew where Art, Art was at now. And Art Yeager was demanding. He brought us the he, – he was demanding. He gave us the deal we wanted at Priority. He, he partnered up with us. You know what I'm saying? Meaning with priority. Like, we became a partnership. And it wasn't no, you own me, I own you, you own more, I own more. It wasn't that. It was a family. Brian Turner is a, is a great, 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 great guy. And he gave us, a, she gave us a shot. And we gave him a shot. And and we both went in and said, let's, let's do this. And the only thing that, that shut down priority was, you know, the fact that Ice Cube and Mac-10 and Dub C went in there and they smashed tables, guns that draw, you know, all this shit, broke glass tables. You know, they they just was not playing, you know, when they ran up in priority records because they felt like they wasn't getting all of their shit. And they destroyed them in that place. And the next day I went in, not too long ago after I went in, I mean, they had security. It was like a maze trying to get through the cops, trying to get to Brian. 
And Brian one day said, I quit. He gave up the game. And me with Duck Down Records had to, was on, we, had, we, was, we was fit, it was finished. Jay Z with Rockefeller Records went over to Def Jam. You know, Mac 10 and Ice Cube. And so people don't even know that, that Rockefeller was with us. Our cipher. They was with us. They, people don't even know Rockefeller was with Priority Records. Reasonable doubt. You think Rockefeller was, huh? Reasonable doubt. That's the first album, yeah. Yeah, they didn't. They, but they don't look at the label part. They just think reason. Reasonable doubt. Rockefeller Records. Jay took crack money and started his own label. Ah, like that's not what happened. Jay uh, became very successful with Priority Records, and Jay was smart. When Leo stepped to him and said, "What do you want to do? You want to come over here?" And he came over there, and that did, and that was a that, that it was a great move for Jay. It was a terrible move for 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 Rockefeller. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap: a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles. The streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.